Amen. Acts chapter 5, verses 33 through 39. Fapte la Apostolul, capitolul 5, 33 through 39. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open that. The New King James Version translation says it this way. When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. This is the Sanhedrin. This is the leaders of the religious sect. Then one in the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in respect by all the people and commanded them to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he, Gamaliel, said to them, Men of Israel, take heed or pay attention to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. For some time ago, Theodos rose up claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He also perished. And all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But it, if it is of God... You cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. Father, we thank you for these moments. Let your spirit speak. Help us receive your word. Be encouraged by your word. Have a heart, Lord, ready to receive it. We love you and we thank you. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus, the strong son of God. And all God's people said, amen. amen. Please have a seat. God is good. All and all the time. Um. We, like my dad said, we celebrated uh, with my parents their 45 years of an anniversary. God bless them. I also want to ask uh, for a temporary relief. Um, we're supposed to celebrate uh, graduates today. We're delaying that one week. Uh, I was traveling and there was some last minute addition. So if you would please be gracious enough for next week and we'll celebrate all the graduates. And I say thank you. Amen. 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 Um, tonight... Uh, we're going to, for the next 20, 30 minutes, we're going to go through this chapter. But I want to I set it up. I want to spend about two, three minutes and set up what this chapter is about. Um, chapter 5, um, there's these disciples, uh, these new sects, these Jesus lovers almost. You know, people who have been transformed by, and there's miracles going on. You know, there's, and, diff, and there's whispers, what's going on, and you know, what's, Who's doing what and who are these new folks? And these verses, verses 33 through 39, really focus in on the leadership of the religious um, Sanhedrin. Um, and especially a man named Gamaliel. And so they get together. You know, there's these miracles going on, different things. People are giving their life to Christ. Miracles are, are, are happening and they're... They don't believe Messiah came. They still believe they were waiting for him. And they don't believe in Jesus. So they're gathered together and they want, and the Bible says they put him in prison. <laughs> the problem is the angel opened the door to the prison. <laughs> and so they, they come out and they're preaching the gospel. They're preaching the gospel. And I want to say this again. Uh, men, husbands, fathers, ladies, mothers, listen, hear me. Miracles almost always come when you preach the gospel. It's hard to almost, I haven't found it. I'm not saying it doesn't exist. I haven't found a, a, an area where a miracle happens in the New Testament where the gospel is not preached. Because when you hear the gospel, you preach the gospel, you talk about Jesus, all of a sudden the supernatural comes into that presence. It comes. So there, this... It's uneasy, right? You hear whispers, people talking at restaurants, at the Olive Garden, right? The Starbucks, people talking about, man, I saw this miracle happen. And they get together and they're about to beat them. And the Bible even says they wanted to put them to death. And Gamaliel says, time out. He says, hey, let's get these guys out of here. Let's talk just us. So they put out the disciples and they talk and they say these words, verses 33 through 39. They say, hey, are we fighting against God? Or is this just from people, just men? And, he, and I want to leave this verse up, and I want you to focus on these words. Keep away from these men and leave or let them alone. Verse 39, but if it is of God, everybody say God. If it's God, 
You're fighting against God. There's no way you're going to win. And, and the chapter ends in the, next, in the next verse. It says they listened to him. They let him go. They told him not to do it anymore. So tonight I want to focus in on that verse 39 and really focus in on that question that I, I put up here. Are you resisting God? Are you resisting God? In Zechariah chapter 7 verse 11, but they refused to listen and pay attention and turned a stubborn shoulder, almost like you turn your shoulder and stop their ears. In, in other words, they just put their fingers in their ears. I, I'm not listening. Are you resisting God? Uh, in other words, are you putting barriers in front of God? There's some of you here tonight that have been called to be ministers. There's some of you here tonight that have been called to preach the gospel in corporate America. There's some of you here tonight that are called to be prayer warriors. But there's something within you that's resisting that calling. I feel it so deeply in my spirit. Hallelujah. I feel it so deep. Some of you are resisting and you're putting barriers in front of God. Some of you have been blessed with business and blessed with the, with the mind and the creativity to invent, to, to lift up. And you're resisting what God has put in front of you. And God's going to speak to you tonight. Because those barriers that you're putting and those shoulders that you keep leaning and those ears you want to keep putting in your ear and you don't want to listen, the Holy Spirit is going to speak to you. Because some of you literally are fighting against God. And you have to ask yourself one question. That prophecy that you had when you were 17 years ago, that prayer that you used to pray with tears in your eyes two or three years ago, when you came before God and you said, God, if you give me a wife, God, if you give me a child, God, if you give me advancement in my business, God, if you deliver me from this sin, that promise that you made, and you said, God, I will be there, I will be a, a person in Sunday school, I will be a person in corporate America, I will be a doctor that shines for you. Wherever you put me. And you've literally started putting barriers in front of God. You've resisting God. And almost like this Sanhedrin, you are fighting against God. I want to tell you that religion has fought against God. But so has unbelievers have fought against God. The difference is, and this is the tragedy. This is the absolute demonic tra tragedy. Religion says it's because of God. Religion will do it in the name of God. They will hurt people in churches. Many of you have been hurt in churches. I've been hurt in churches. My wife, many, many years ago, was told by a pastor, there is no hope for you. You cannot go to heaven. And that made her and forced her to get deeper into the Bible and, and understand that she can go to heaven. I want to tell you that there are people even in churches today, that will put barriers, that will fight, and will try to keep you, almost keep you out of God's presence. I want to give you a couple examples. Number one, I'm going to talk about Jonah. Everybody say Jonah. Jonah chapter 1. Now the word of the Lord, the very first verse. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to? Where is he supposed to go? He's supposed to buy a train ticket, a bus ticket, a boat ticket, whatever you want to call it. He's supposed to go to Nineveh. Let's keep going. That great city, you can't miss it. It's, a, it's not a little podunk city on the map. You know, hey, I'm Trecut. I, I passed it by mistake. It's, the exit off-ramp wasn't that clearly marked, Pastor David. I, I, I didn't know. Uh-uh. It's a great city. And God says, go there and do this because their sin's great. That's it. Don't worry about the results. See, too many of us are worried about the results. My job is to preach the gospel. Your job is to share your testimony. If the other people come to Christ, that's between them and God. Our job is to share them what we have experienced with God. What I know is true of God. And, and Jonah says, I'm going to go to the train ticket. I'm going to go to the boat. Uh, fares and instead of going to Nineveh, I'm going to go the exact opposite way. Where does he go instead? Tarsus. Literally, if you look on the map, he's supposed to go east. He buys a ticket to go west. He literally goes in the opposite direction. God is calling him to go this way, and he actually buys a ticket to go other ways. I'm going to share something with you. Was that legal in front of men? 
legally, he was right. He bought a ticket. He paid the price. He was legal. He could go do it. But I'm telling you something. He was illegal in front of God. See, some of us want to be right by, oh, I did my part. Oh, I paid the ticket. I paid the price. I went to college. I did this. The problem is you're trying to be right with people, and God is calling you to be right with him. And so you can be legal with people. But God is saying, you're illegal with me. It ain't right. It's not what I called you to do. I called you to go east, and you're going west instead. And he was fighting and resisting the voice, the calling, the ministry of God to be the, to be the voice. To be the voice. See, some of us say, oh, man, America's so bad. I hear some of you. We're in a culture war. I can't believe what's happening in so and so. And our president, this and our president. And you, you, but see, same thing was happening in Nineveh. Child sacrifices, whatever you, abortions, if you want to equate it to that, that's fine. And God was about to work a miracle. The problem was it was all dependent on who? On Jonah. Jonah never showed up. Jonah delayed in showing up. See, sometimes that miracle that you're waiting for in your business, in your relationship, in a, in a city, in your workplace, in your job, is because you haven't answered that call. It's because God keeps talking to you, keeps pushing you, keeps speaking to you like a message tonight. He's speaking to you. And you keep resisting. Say, like, oh, that's for, that's for the guy over there on the bench. That's for the, oh, I know. That, that's for my cousin over there who's sitting in church. Oh, that's for that person over there. But it's not, and you keep resisting and pushing what God is trying to share with you. Are you resisting God's anointing? I wrote that in my prayer time. Are you fighting God's call? Some of you have been called, in, <laughs> and, I, and I, preach a message, uh, I preach a message about losing your mission. And I say, Satan will do three things. He will distract you, he will discourage you, and he will divide you. And I talk about those three things. And that's what the devil says so much. He'll give you too much work. Oh, I'll get to it later. And years pass by. And that passion that you used to have never comes back. I want to tell you that that revival would never have happened or might have been delayed much longer if Jonah never came. If Jonah never came. Pastor uh, Fratele Cosmi was talking earlier about disobedience and obedience and how proud God is, how mundo he is, how joyful he is when we walk in obedience to him. Because God has a plan. God wants us to walk in obedience with him. And Jonah in the Old Testament was the first example of resisting God. The second example I want to go quickly is in Numbers chapter 22. A man called Balaam. Everybody say Balaam. Balaam chapter 22 in the book of Numbers. I'm going to read verse 12 and then verse 22. And God said to Balaam, you shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people for they are blessed. Verse 22, 10 verses later. Then God's anger was aroused because he went. Remember what Cosmo was like, stop, but I want to go. But stop but I want to go. And the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him. Uh, this is the story, and many of you know Balaam, but real quick. Uh, Balaam was a man that everybody knew in that location. When he would say a blessing over to you, you would be blessed. He was, I don't want to use the term sorcerer, but he was a man who only said God's word, and when he said God's word, he, you would be blessed. Or you would be cursed. So there was a king named Balak, very similar name, goes up to him and says, hey, I'm going to pay you all this money. I'm going to give you the Ritz-Carlton in downtown L.A. I'm going to give you so much. I'm going to give you uh, this tower, Trump Tower. I don't know. Just, I'm, I'm going to just fill your pockets with all this money. I'm going to make you one of the richest men. But I want you to curse this nation. And he brings them and he says, I want you to curse the Israelites, the God's people. And he goes and he prays. Everybody say pray. I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And he prays. And God says, uh-uh. That's a no-go zone. You can't go. Cannot pass. Cannot go past. Cannot co collect 200. You cannot go. And he keeps trying to figure out, figure out, and resist God. He literally fights God. And he still goes, verse 22. And then this is what happens. An angel shows up. Everybody says angel. When you are fighting God, you need to understand something. 
When you are resisting God, you are resisting the author of life. There is no weapon that you can come up with. The Bible says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper because you are the son. You're walking in obedience because you are a daughter. You're walking in obedience. You, you are messing with the creator of everything. There's a, there's a, there's a preacher, uh, a pastor preacher who says, if you fall into man's hands, God can save you. But if you fall into God's hands, no one can save you. You are deal. You are dead on arrival. You're done. You're cooked. So the, the, the Bible says, God says one angel. Everybody say one. And if you look in, in the Bible, one angel, what can one angel do? Let's look. 2 Kings chapter 19. One angel shows up. King Hezekiah is praying. He says, I can't defeat this army. So God sends one angel because King Hezekiah prays. Again, he prays. See this? Spiritual connection. He prays. Verse 35, 2 Kings chapter 19. And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians. How much? 185,000 men. We're not talking about little G.I. Joes here. We're talking about SEAL Team 6 kind of guys. We're talking about Assyrians. They've conquered. They are conquerors. These are not newbies coming out of, you know, boot camp. These are, these are dangerous hombres. These are assassins. And 185 of them, 1,000, get wiped out by one angel. You think Balaam knew what he was doing? The Bible says he stopped in his tracks, not because of him, but because of his donkey. When you fight against God, listen, when you are resisting God, you are resisting his angels. You are resisting the author of life. You are resisting the host of heaven. You are resisting. You are literally pushing back against God. When God has spoken to you. The Bible says, God spoke to me once and I heard it twice. God has spoken to you. It was through a person here and a person there, through a message over here, through a song over there. And God's spoken to you. And you're still deciding, sitting on that bench tonight. Well, is it really God? And I feel like in my spirit and my soul, God has sent me tonight to say even to myself, what am I resisting God in? What am I pushing? What am I saying, God, I don't know. What if you do? And we put barriers. God, if you do this, if you give me that, if you put this over there, if you put this over here. And we keep putting barriers in front of God. And God is saying, why my son? Why my daughter? You call me author. You call me savior. But you obey me not. And I've spoken to you. And just like Balaam, we are resisting the voice of God. We are resisting the voice of God. Second Chronicles chapter 32 says it again. He sent an angel to cut down every mighty man of valor, leader, captain of the camp of the king of Assyria. We skip over to the New Testament. So we talked about Jonah. We talked about Balaam. And now we're talking about Saul becomes Paul. And I, and I put OT there. I, I should have put New Testament. So please forgive me. Acts chapter 9. Everybody say Acts chapter 9. Good. I can hear you. Then he fell to the ground. This is Saul, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads or, or rocks, big rocks. You know, back then they wore these sandals. They weren't very, they, you didn't have the, as we have those boots with the, with the metal tip. You guys know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he didn't have any of that. He's trying to kick with his little skin kind of shoes and sandals and the bible says why are you persecuting me and i wanted i wanted to go back and i started reading and i read chapter five chapter four you know when gamaliel literally says those words we just read it right you're fighting against god listen to me is it is it a is it something of man or is it something of god and i thought was saul in the crowd on that day when his teacher stood up and said, you're fighting against God. Was Saul there in the Sanhedrin, heard the voice of his leader, his mentor. The Bible says his mentor. He learned at the feet of Gamaliel. That's what it says in scripture. And he wanted to prove his mentor wrong. He wanted to prove that it was of men and not of God. Do you think he came from out of that room where he heard all these men talking about killing these disciples of Jesus? 
this Messiah, he didn't believe it. And he started going, "Uh uh-uh, I'm going to prove my mentor wrong. I'm going to prove this old man with white hair wrong. I'm going to prove, I got, I got, I got a successful ladder to climb up. And on this road, the Bible says that he saw a, he saw a light. It wasn't just him. The second picture is just him. But the first, he, was, he had two other companions. He saw a light. He heard a voice. And the voice was only heard by him. Now, I want to tell you that the same God we serve of miracles is a God of judgment. If you believe that, say amen. The same God we want to talk about miracles. We want to talk about miracles. But we have to understand that God is also a God of judgment. And if that's not convenient for you, you got to go to another church. And if that's not convenient for you, you better find a different Bible. That I don't know what book that is. Because in chapter 4, and I'm going to show you this. In chapter 3, I'm going to show you a couple of verses. Peter says, silver and gold I do not have. There's a, there's a beggar who's like got these feet that don't work. He's sitting out there. Silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Verse 7. He took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankles, bones received strength. All of a sudden it's like this, this power goes in his legs and he can walk. And that's chapter 3 in verse 8. So he leaping up. See, this, this is inconvenient for some of us old school Christians. Leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple. What did he do in the temple? He was walking and and praising God. Oh, I don't know if I want to go to that church. Those people are praising God. Those people are leaping for God. Those people have a a marturicide. They have a witness that God saved them from drugs. God saved them from pornography. God saved them from cancer. God saved them. But I don't want to go to that church because it's not convenient for me. But God is speaking to you. If this man stood up and he said, oh, I I got some new strength in my legs. I want to show off because God did something in my life. And he stands up and he's leaping. And if your tradition doesn't allow for leaping, and your tradition and your understanding of God doesn't allow praise, you better sanctify yourself and read chapter 3 in the book of Acts. Because God says, that's what I do in you. There's something that moves you. Because God is with me. And he moves and he jumps and he lives and he breathes. And then go to chapter 5. Well, we don't want to read chapter 5. Chapter 5 is a tough chapter. I want to talk about the miracles. I don't want to talk about the judgment, David. David, don't. Let's skip that chapter. Let's kind of, you know, hide it over there. Chapter 5, at the very first, it talks about lying in church. Some of you have no problem lying. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Look at verse 3. Peter said... Why has Satan filled? Everybody say filled. Filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit. You're sitting here tonight, you're thinking lie is not a big deal. Lying, no, 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 no. Lying is a big deal. The king of liars is who? Satan. Do you know who we, you or me, or glory? When we say, l'am invertit putzin, l'am floricit putzin, I kind of, did it why has satan filled your heart to lie to the holy spirit some of you lied to your husband some of you lied to your wives some of you lied to your children some of you lied to your boss i'm running late you overslept i don't feel so good you want to go on vacation come on david you're too strict this is what the bible says filled your heart to lie to the holy spirit and keep back so he sold a piece of land Real estate, it's a really good market like today, really good market. He sells the piece of land. He says, oh, I sold it for $100,000 and I bring all the, he said, did you really sell it for $100,000? No. He's lying. So he comes to church and then skip over to verse 5. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. So the same God, we want to talk about the miracles. We want to talk about the jumping. We want to talk about the leaping. We want to talk about the great things God does. It's the same God who judges you when you start lying. When you start acting out. Because God, I say it all the time, God is not concerned with your talents. 
Some of you are very talented. Music and business and creativity and inventions. God is worried about your character. If you remember two weeks ago, we talked about character. We reward our children based on their talents or how pretty they are or how, how good their grades are when God is saying, that's okay, but praise them when they have character. Praise them when they tell the truth. Praise them. Lift them up when they are acting godly, when they have that godly character. So are you fighting or resisting God? Are you fighting or resisting God's calling, God's anointing, God's voice in your life? Everybody knows what this is, right? It's a keyboard made up of two words, key, board. And on this keyboard, obviously, you have all 26 letters of the English alphabet. You have different numbers. And then you have these special buttons. Insert, delete, page up, page down. You have all these buttons. And let me see if I got this. Yeah. So you have all these buttons on this keyboard. You can go up. You can go down. You got the Windows button. So you have these special buttons. And, you, and the IT guys are in here, so you guys can help me. You communicate using the keyboard. Keyboard. It's hard to communicate. You guys even have one on your phone, your Apple phone. You have a keyboard to text, right? Some of you use Siri. I get it. I get it. But most of the time you're typing, you're, you're using, you're pressing enter, cutting and pasting. Well, this keyboard has a button that we don't have in real life. It's called the undo button. Undo. Because you know why? We like to print all our papers without mistakes. Because we like to print a report that has no gaps. We like to print a report that shows how perfect and nice and smart we are. No mistakes. So we have a button, control Z, I think it is, right? Undo. I never knew what that word, <laughs> that word does not exist in real life. In real life, you have a paper that looks like this. Crossed out, highlighted, messed up, scratched over, right? Real life doesn't have a button called undo. But it does have a button called it does have a button called? See, God says to us, I'm not giving you an undo button. I'm not letting you go back in history and change who, what you did or what you, I'm not letting you do, uh-uh. But I'm giving you a redo button. I'm giving you something. The Bible says, I can give you back, whew, hallelujah. I can give you back the years that the locusts and the canker worm have taken from you. All those years in prison, all those years in sin, all the things you, you thought you lost a decade of your life. And God is speaking to someone tonight. He's saying, no, 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 no. You have a mighty God. He does not look at a decade the way you look at a decade. When he sees you, time does not, oh no, I got to move it over here. God says, when you're ready, he's ready. And when he's ready, he's going to lift you up. Hear me, church. He will lift you up. He will take you out of that sin. He will take you out of the bondage. Not because you have an undo button, but because you have a redo button. And you can say, oh, hallelujah, Satan, look at my past. I was that. But now I'm a new creation. All things, all things, behold, a new creation. I make all things new. I want to tell you that in my prayer time, I want to tell you in my prayer time, your keyboard in spiritual life is your prayer life. Can I hear an amen? Some of you don't have power because you don't pray. Some of you don't have power because you don't pray. I want to tell you that in my, in my prayer time, I wrote this down. You're going to have to work twice as hard because you're not going to pray about it. Some of you have to work two times or three times as hard as something. I don't know what it is. Cooking career, fine, I don't know, but you're working more about, because you're unwilling to pray about it. I feel so many times in church, we're willing to hear a sermon, who cares about David? We're willing to hear a song, but we're unwilling to pray, because we're unwilling to pray, God says, you're going to have to work two times as hard, you're going to have to work three times as hard, because God doesn't call his house a house of worship, he doesn't call it a house of song, he doesn't call it a house of preaching, he calls it a house of prayer, and when you come into God's house, I want to tell you church, you need to learn how to pray.
You need to grab your wife. You need to grab your husband and say, I know it's hard. I know it takes five, ten minutes until we hit that sweet spot. Until it's inclusive. You know, we want, we want microwave prayers. Instant coffee. That's what we want. We want instant. Man, bagam repede la microwave, boom, cafeaua. But back in the old days, you couldn't do that. You had to make a little fire. You had to get that pot of water. You had to. And you understood. Listen, you understood. It takes time to get into God's presence. It's not a 30-second quick, our Father who art in heaven, amen. It takes time. And some of us want to sing. We want to listen to podcasts. We want to give. But we do not want to pray. And that's why we do not have power. I want to tell you that when you pray, hate leaves your life. It's hard to get in an argument with your wife when you just finish praying. Woo, this is real. Oh, listen, hear me. You just got in an argument? You just got in a fight? Brother, listen, listen to, I'm, I'm living this life. Listen, go in your room, close that door, Lord, and you just start praying. I guarantee you cannot pray 20, 30, 40 minutes and then come back outside the same. That means you haven't prayed. I'm telling you right now. You haven't, when you pray, you swap. You swap out what you have. You say, God, I have this povada. I have this apasa. I have this, I'm giving it to you. And God says, okay, give it to me. I'll give you peace. Give me that hatred. Give me that charta. Give me that ura. Give it to me and I'll give you love and forgiveness. See, some of us can't forgive because we haven't prayed about it. We haven't come to God and prayed about it. Because the keyboard, the redo, the, the key to doing that is your prayer life. Forgiveness comes. You can't hate your brother. You can't fight your spouse. You can't argue with your pastor. You can't be better with your mother because you've been praying. You've been in the presence of God. See, praying more than, see, praying, we say, is communication with God. But it's specific to God. When someone says, man, I've been praying, I've been talking to God. And you can, it's like, um, it's like uh, garlic. It's like usturoy. You can, you can smell it on them. Say it ain't, amen? You can tell when someone's been praying. Right? Man, they have a peace about them. I'm not saying they look like Moses. Some, some people I've talked to, they, they have just a, I, hey, how's it going? Man, God is so good. And they're not, in, they're just, they're just so happy. They've been, in, they've been in the presence of God. When you pray, I, I wrote this down, you untie your desires of your flesh. You untie your desires of your flesh and you tie your godly desires to your soul. I want to tell you that when you pray, you can find answers that Google does not have. You can find answers that Google or, or, or what's the other one, Bing or DuckDuckGo. I don't know what web browser you use. They cannot find the answers that God can give you when you pray. Because you've prayed about it. The, I've said this again. Some things don't change until you pray. Pray about it. Let me finish here. I am thankful for second chances. Do you hear me, church? I am thankful for second chances. I am thankful that religion doesn't give me a second chance, but Jesus gives me a second chance. I am thankful that the prodigal son got a second chance. I am thankful that the woman caught in adultery got a second chance. Because I serve a God who believes in second chances. Jonah, he went the wrong way on purpose. He paid money to go to Tarsus on purpose. He got in into it. He, got, he stepped into it on purpose. And God still give him a second chance. I want to tell you that Balaam didn't hear the voice of God. He didn't, and then the donkey was about to, you know, he's about to die. And what happens? God lets him live. He gives him a second chance. I want to tell you that Paul, whose name was Saul, but now all of a sudden got converted, wrote 14 books of the New Testament. Some people say 16, but at least 14 of the New Testament. And God gave him a second chance, even though he deliberately fought and resisted the voice of God. Some of you need that second chance tonight. Some of you, God's anointing has been on your marriage, your life, your children, and you keep resisting God. And God is speaking to you, not through a man, not through a microphone, but by the Holy Spirit. And says, take out Jonah's name, take out Balaam's name, take out Paul's name, and put your name there. And say, I have give, been given a second chance. And let me tell you something, a second chance doesn't mean anything if you don't learn from the first First, have you learned your lesson? 
Have you learned? Forget the mistake. God is saying, I've said, this, oh, hallelujah. Forget the mistake. The mistakes come. You're human. I get it. But have you learned the lesson? Have you learned the lesson? A second chance doesn't mean anything if you don't learn from your first. I want to tell you that every moment of your life is a second chance. I want to tell you that every moment you're here tonight, the devil's going to try to whisper and say, you don't have a second chance. Maybe a marriage, maybe a bondage, maybe a sin, maybe something that's holding you back. I don't know what it is. God knows what it is. But if you're here tonight, do you need a second chance to forgive? Do you need a second chance to stop your addiction? Do you need a second chance to have a breakthrough? Do you need a second chance to be free from your sin or your bondage? Holy Spirit, not a church, not a denomin not a preacher. The Holy Spirit makes that transformation. He's the one who gives you the second, not a preacher. No, don't let anybody lie to you. Nobody ain't that holy. <laughs> there's God, <laughs> there's Jesus, then there's everybody else. Holy Spirit gives you that second chance. I want to invite you to stand up. If you've been here tonight, you are not here by accident. I know some of you say, oh, David, I come here Sunday nights. This is my habit. I want to tell you that you're not here by accident because you could have been somewhere else. You could have been involved, invited to a dinner party. You could have been invited to someone's birthday. You could have been out of town traveling on vacation. You are not here by mistake. God has spoken to you. If you have been resisting God, if you have been fighting God, if you have just give, putting barriers in front of God, God says, stop fighting me on that calling on your life. Stop calling me on that. Dumnezeu uh, vrea să te implică, să se... I don't know what it is. Maybe it's writing a check. Maybe it's involved in Sunday school. Maybe it's helping out with youth. Maybe it's going to prison ministry. Maybe it's helping. I don't know what it is. Each one of you knows what it is. And you've been fighting God on it. And God has given you a second chance. It says, this night, this May 2022, I have spoken to you. And I'm giving you a second chance. I'm giving you a second chance. God is merciful. God is so good. He's given me so many chances. And God is speaking to you. Stop resisting the voice of God. Receive that anointing. Answer the phone. Answer the call of God on your life. Amen, church? If you need a second chance, I want to pray for you. I want to encourage you. I want to lift you up. God is here. His presence is here. We're going to all pray together. But God has spoken to you specifically. I want you to ask him, God, give me the second chance, the faith to move forward. Faith to move forward. And how do you increase your faith? Pray. Keep praying. Hear the voice of God. Hear the word of God. But pray. Get in his presence. Pray. Close that door in your room and just pray. Let's all pray together. And we'll finish with the Lord's prayer tonight. Father.